Chapter 1. Perinatal Developments and a Few Other Bits I was born in Leamington, now officially known as Royal Leamington Spa, moderately famous for the manufacture of gas cookers. The year was 1942, and the period of gestation ended on the 7th of February during a rather botched-up air raid in which the Germans thought they were hitting Coventry. My parents, Tim and Beryl, sorry, Tim and Betty, were outraged when I arrived because they'd been expecting a heterosexual black Jew with several rather amusing birth deformities as they needed the problems. They lived in an enormous Gothic castle in the south of France called Dun Drinking Gin and Slimline Tonic with Ice But No Lemon In, which was originally built by Marco Polo for himself and a few friends he wanted to invite round to his place after the pub closed an awe-inspiring construction of granite and bits of wood with sweeping lawns recently modified to include an ornamental malaria swamp. He felt a sharp stab of steel in his groin and the sickening sensation of the warm ooze of blood welling up inside his flying jacket. A screaming hail of bullets punched through his left ear as he mused, hey, that was my ear. Thinking this over, he continued to massage the coconut milk into her firm young breasts. He took another mouthful, letting it dribble slowly onto the tip of each erect nipple, and watched it stream tantalising down towards the moistly quivering lips of her French poodle, Kipper. I must admit, uh, so far, that Chapter 1 has uh, not had much more than a grain of truth in it, uh, but it is more interesting than all the usual humdrum wetting of nappies and later pants and not being allowed to sit next to Lottie, the Czechoslovakian girl, because I once shat myself, seeing bits of people hanging from trees. Oh, that does sound interesting. Perhaps I should put that down. Where was I? Yes, I was three at the time, and my mother wanted to take me along to see my father, being a policeman, which is something he did most days. A street in Wigston Magna, 1944. There has just been an explosion in an aircraft in which nine free Polish airmen had been flying. The force of the explosion has reduced them to their component parts, and one can see quite clearly a lung hanging down from the lower branches of a chestnut tree, a leg on a front lawn, and a hole in the roof of a semi-detached, which was later explained by a lady who came out of the house carrying a bucket with what looked like a liver in it. The three-year-old boy is not particularly worried because he's holding his mummy's hand and his daddy is in charge and being very efficient about trying to sort out bits of human flesh into at least nine different sacks. Unfortunately, there seem to be only eight heads and no other suspicious roof holes. Mummy calls out to daddy, Walter, sorry dear, I'm busy. Hey you, that sack's already got two legs in it. Reflecting on this, I go, wah, inwardly, and I'm just thinking of going, wah, outwardly when my mother grabs my hand. Walter dear, we were just going out shopping and I thought that Graham might like... Look dear, I'll see you later. Has anyone found that head yet? Hey, has anyone in this street found a head? Come on, someone must have it. I know this street. You'd whip anything. I mean, what the bloody hell are you going to do with a head? Well dear, perhaps we'll go and get your tea. What? Oh yes, egg on toast please. Left arm here. Anyone missing a left arm? We haven't got any eggs. There's a war on. Ask Harold. Something's bound to have fallen off the back of a lorry. All right, dear, come on, Graham, stop staring at all that blood. It won't do you any good. Oh, come on, Mum, this must be one of my major formative experiences. Ah! And so, London, 1895, Oscar Wilde's residence. In the glittering drawing room are gathered a glittering group. The cream of London society, the Prince of Wales, James McNeil Whistler, George Bernard Shaw and Wilde himself are just a few of the notables present. Inevitably, it is Oscar Wilde the party centres around. Raising his glass of champagne, the prince speaks to his host. My congratulations, Wilde. Your play is a great success. The whole of London is talking about you. The group waits expectantly for the master of the paradox to be paradoxical. Wilde does not disappoint them. There is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. For a full minute, the laughter reverberates around the room. Whistler turns puce with envy. Shaw twitches with jealousy. Aubrey Beardsley micturates in pique. Max Beerbohm stuffs a sour grape up his nostril, and Jane Austen revolves in her grave. The prince claps Oscar on the shoulder. Very witty, very witty. The game is afoot. Whistler takes a breath and reposts. There is only one thing worse in the world than being witty, and that is not being witty. It is a hit. The room rocks with laughter for another full minute. Oscar Wilde's face goes as green as his carnation. Shaw winces. B. 
Beardsley, feeling a pang of resentment, defecates in a riding boot. Beerbum enviously punches a hole in a Chinese silk screen, and Jane Austen's false breast falls off. Wilde opines, I wish I had said that. Whistler smiles at him. He had expected that incisive retort and is ready for it. You will, Oscar, you will. Wilde weighs an effete hand in the direction of Whistler. Your Highness, do you know James McNeil Whistler? Ducking the effete hand, the prince declares, Yes, we play squash together. Wilde is in like a rapier. There is only one thing worse than playing squash together, and that is playing it by yourself. He waits expectantly for the roars of laughter and the shrieks of glee. They do not come. The silence grows longer. So does Shaw's beard. Eventually, Oscar mutters, I wish I hadn't said that. Seeing his bosom friend with egg on his face, Whistler cannot resist the temptation to throw an omelette. You did, Oscar, you did. The room rocks with laughter. Exhausted with the excellence of the wit and the gay bonhomie, the prince bids his host farewell. You must forgive me, Wilde, but I must get back up the palace. Wilde is desperate. It's unheard of. The Prince of Wales, leaving with a smile on his face that had not been put there by Oscar Wilde, he blurts, Your Majesty, you are like a big jam donut with cream on top. A shocked hush descends on the room. The Prince of Wales, like his mother on a previous occasion, is not amused. I beg your pardon? Wilde splutters, completely at a loss. Uh, 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 it was one of Whistler's. The game is now not merely a foot, it's putting the boot in. I didn't say that. You did, James, you did. The Prince of Wales and the assembled company gaze expectantly at Whistler. For a moment, the celebrated painter is at a loss. Then, I meant that... Like a doughnut, your arrival gives us pleasure, and your departure makes us hungry for more. Loud laughter and applause follow this elegant explanation. Encouraged, Whistler moves on to the attack. Your Majesty is like a stream of bats piss. Over the gasps, the Prince of Wales thunders, I beg your pardon? Coolly, the painter gazes at the prince. It was one of Wilde's. How will the hero of a thousand cul-de-sacs cope with this one? The gathering does not have to wait long for an answer. The mind that has been sharpened to a sword's edge through years of verbal fencing rises brilliantly to the occasion. It sodding well, wasn't it? was one of Shaw's. Bernard Shaw totters visibly as the buck that has been past him hangs heavily round his neck. But this is the man destined to write Arms and the Man and its astonishing sequel Armpits and the Woman. Smiling at the prince, he speaks softly... I merely meant, Your Majesty, that you shine out like a shaft of gold when all around is dark. There is a ripple of awed admiration. The ease with which Shaw had escaped from the sinking ship has been remarkable. Shaw has been put on his mettle by a fellow Irishman, and to Shaw a fellow Irishman is fair game. He gives Wilde a wicked look and then coolly drops the doyen of distinguished society in the ordure. Your Majesty is like a dose of clap. There is a collective gasp of horror. The horror becomes near panic when Shaw, not waiting for the prince's superb rejoinder of I beg your pardon, continues, Before you arrive is pleasure, but after a pain in the dong. The Prince of Wales pales in anger, and there is a lot of him. There is a lot of pale. What? he shrieks. Then Shaw plays his master card. It was one of Wilde's. Every eye in the room looks at Oscar Wilde, including the bloodshot pair belonging to the Prince of Wales. I'm waiting, Wilde. I'm waiting. 